I'd just like to say that I'm hoping this isn't going to be too exciting for you because this is, this is the dead slot immediately after lunch. So they thought if they put a nice doddering old fool on at this time, it would be nice and gentle. Um, before I start the PowerPoints, I must just say that the title Indian Feng Shui is not mine. But we won't go there. I have a great objection to it being called Indian Feng Shui. Much as I su suspect that Feng Shui consultants object to it as well. There is a common heritage, as I think you will find. This is just going to be a taster. If you're that interested, talk to the society. They might be able to sort of put my arm up my back and I'll run a workshop. But this is just a taster and some idea of the basic principles of Wastu, not necessarily to compare it to Feng Shui, but I know you will be making comparisons as you go. <coughs> Wastu has a more obvious spiritual basis. This little prayer is what should be recited by a Wastu consultant when he is approaching a home or any other building. It's quite interesting, and if you read it quickly, you'll see that, yes, it makes perfect common sense. And then you read it again, and you spot an interesting word in there. It's not just about restoring order to a building or any space. It's cosmic order. And Wastu makes no pretense at any stage that the alterations, the placements, the cures, the recommendations are all related directly to the cosmos. So there's our little prayer. And you see again the elements of fire and water that have been spoken of quite a lot already today. We call it Wastu. Well, I suppose most of you call it Vastu. But it's actually pronounced Wastu because Sanskrit doesn't have a V in it. But it isn't just Wastu. There is Wastu Vidya, Wastu Shilpa, and Wastu Shastra. Wastu Vidya is the most fundamental wisdom of Wastu. Wastu Shilpa is that same wisdom applied to sculpture and art. And what we end up with is Wastu Shastra, which is the wisdom or science of building in application. It's, it's at its most practical. And you'll see I've put the double A in there, which tells you how it's properly <coughs> pronounced. But you can call it Vastu. It comes from a Vedic tradition. The ancient Vedas are thought to go back to at least 5000 BC. They were written down, of course, much later, much more recently. And if you want to know all about Vastu, delve into the Upanishads, which are a vast series of writings. You can talk, really call them essays delivered at the feet of the master. And there is one Upanishad, known as the Atawa Upanishad, which is pretty incomprehensible unless you realize it's describing the foundation of Wastu, <coughs> because most of it's about the dimensions of the ideal body, the ideal <coughs> human body. And the reason for that will become obvious in a moment. Most of the knowledge of Wastu comes from another body of work called the Brihad Samhita. There are very, very few good English translations of the Brihad Samhita. And I thought I was going to have to pay an absolute fortune to track one down and import it from India. And then I thought, this shows my age, it wasn't my first thought, I thought of Googling it. <laughs> so I Googled it. 
and I'm now in possession of 500 pages of Brihad Samhita from Harvard Library. So if you want to stuff your computer inbox full of 500 pages of good English translation of the Brihad Samhita, then Google it, find the, the free Google digitized version of it from Harvard Library. The reason I mention those two is that there is really little other genuine source as textbooks. There are, like Feng Shui, there are lots of books on the shelves. You know, The Way of Wastu, Wealth and Prosperity, and all sorts of others. I've imported several from India. But if you go back to the originals, you then are faced with the dimensions and rules and regulations for every single aspect of life, living, and the environment within which that life is to be lived. But until you recognize that what those two, the, the Upanishad and the Samhita, are talking about is Rastu, they're pretty incomprehensible. Rastu Purusha. Feng Shui has its legend, tortoises coming out of rivers, river horses appearing with everything written on their backs. Wastu also has a marvelous legend. The Lord Shiva was battling with a demon, as one does. A bead of his perspiration fell onto the ground and from that drop of sweat grew another enormous demonic form called the Wastu Purusha. This demonic form, having just been given birth, was hungry. So it set about devouring everything around it. So the other deities said to the Lord Shiva, well, we can't be having this everything's going to disappear. So he said, it's your problem. Suppress this Wastu Purusha. Bring him under control. So 45 deities sat on him, pressed him down, and did a deal with him. You know, like Feng Shui, there's quite a lot of compromise in Wastu. So they did a deal which said, if you'll play ball and look after space and the environment, those that live in it will make sure that you're looked after and nourished. And that's what happened. That is our rather jolly Wastu Purusha. That is not me in an earlier <laughs> incarnation. The Wastu Purusha holds that very symbolic form and is contained in that square. And from that, we move to what, is, what has become known as the Wastu Purusha Mandala. Now, I don't know if you can still make out his form very faintly. But in the initial mandala, you have 81 squares. Each one of those squares has a link with a part of the Wastu Purusha's body, and thus with illness, discomfort, comfort, enhancement, advancement. So you're beginning to see that if you can apply that mandala to a particular space in the same way as you would apply a Bhagwa, you can relate all forms of discomfort to a particular part of that space. This is the very beginning of it. Some parts of that mandala are more important than others. So not surprisingly, you eventually end up with a key area of nine squares right in the center. That sounds familiar?
there are nine squares in the middle of the yellow square. They cover the very essential part of the Vastu Purusha, the heart. And we've heard of the heart earlier today. You see also the basic outline still of the Vastu Purusha. This diagram represents the flow of prana. Prana is the life force, the cosmic breath. If you like, we can call it chi. But in Vastu, it's prana. And it is deemed to flow into any space from the northeast. It reaches the southwest, gets entangled around the, around the Vastu Purusha's toes, and you have an area of confusion. So the, the obvious difference between feng shui and wastu is that wastu is sort of cut on the bias. Wastu works with the three gunas. These are the qualities of nature. Without these three qualities of nature and being in existence, there would be no creation. These three qualities enliven creation, sustain creation, and hold it in place. You have one of the qualities of nature known as tamas, and that is associated with inertia, unconsciousness, apathy, dissolution, pathos, the stillness of the grave, and all the rather somber colors. There is another element, this one in red here, I don't know if that's showing up enough, that's called rajas. That is associated with action, change, energy, anxiety, anger, which can lead to rage. In fact, we get our English word rage from the Sanskrit rajas. It is also the energy by which creation is brought into existence. Then we have the third guna, or quality of nature, sattva. That is also stillness, but it's quite a different quality of stillness. It's a stillness from which unlimited creativity arises. It is positive energy, calm, peace and consciousness bringing contentment and satisfaction. Again, our English word satisfaction and satisfy comes from the Sanskrit word sattva. All the light radiating colors and the blues and greens and white are also associated with that <coughs> quality of nature. I didn't tell you which word we get from Thomas, and that leads to our word tame, which really isn't strong enough. All three qualities of nature are necessary in every single situation. If you had total Thomas within any situation, nothing would happen. If you had total rajas in any situation, nothing would happen because in that nothing, everything is happening. There is no control. Bringing the two together under control, balancing the qualities of nature within the home or within any, within any space, the consultant is able to assist sattva to arise. There is a natural, a sort of ambient balance of the gunas in any, within any space. To the north, there's a balance of rajas and sattva. So in the north, we probably need to work to introduce a bit of tamas to get an overall balance. In the northeast, if you remember, northeast is the entry point of the prana, the most important area within any space, according to the Vastu Purusha mandala. And that is 100% sattva. That is why, if you are looking for anywhere to place an altar, to do puja, 
then you would choose the northeast location. That is the most spiritual area. And the other areas are associated there. I always feel like asking if there are any questions at this point. But there aren't. You seem to be quite happy with this. Getting the, getting the a full understanding of these three qualities of nature, the three guna, is absolutely key and fundamental to being a Wastu consultant. You can go into any space, and once you understand those three qualities, it'll hit you. You might go into a... You could, I mean, we spoke about Chartres Cathedral this morning. As you enter a great cathedral, the overall quality of nature that will hit you will be sattva. Because of the spiritual work that has gone on for centuries and has been absorbed into the fabric, the whole building has become sattvic. If, on the other hand, you choose to go into a, a nightclub, I got told off for call, use, calling them discos the other day. I said, that, you know, they're no longer, it shows your age, but, you know, any sort of venue where people jump up and down and there are bright lights and music, you can tell there's a lot of rajas. And then there are other still places where you just feel the energy is gone, it's just dead. If you only mastered the understanding of the three gunas, you could go and carry out a Wastu consult consultation on a space. There is a bit more to it than that, of course, but that is the starting point. Like Feng Shui, Wastu works with five elements. But there are two different ones. You have air and you have ether. If you want to do a direct comparison with feng shui, air is tree. It doesn't compare quite so well if you're used to calling that element wood. But if you think of the tree, it encloses a volume of air. The tree canopy contains air. Ether is a very interesting one because this will upset your normal concept of what is space. The feng shui element that is associated with the ether is metal. Metal is solid. It's full. It's packed with molecules that are not moving very much. There's so much in metal. But there is so much in space. There is so much in ether. This space all around us, much as again we, we heard Christian say earlier, space is full. Everything that has ever happened, everything that is happening, everything that ever will happen is contained in space. Space is packed. So there is a very direct comparison with, with, with metal. But otherwise, the elements move on and there is a sense connected with each one. I won't read them through because you can probably read them. Again, the bottom one is interesting. Ether is associated with sound. And if you will just listen to the space, it will tell you what is required. You can even Again, linking back to what Christian said, you can even, if you remember, you can ask it. But you need to listen. This is a sort of slight point of difference, I suppose, between Christian and I. Christian is a house whisperer. I'm a space listener. <laughs> so sound is very important as, a, as an aspect of ether. Then you have colour elements, you have the... the geometric and texture connections. But you also bring in taste. Wastu is great on taste. There is one aspect of Wastu that I do not perform. 
a genuine Wastu guru asked to look at a, a greenfield site would actually have to go on site, would have to look at the color of the soil because there are certain colors of soils that are better for some castes than for others. See, Wastu like feng shui is, is not politically correct. But the Wastu consultant is expected to taste the soil as well. And I do draw the line at that. <laughs> so though the taste is very important, and again quite naturally, the elements are to be found ambiently in certain com compass directions. So if you did nothing in a space, and you just relied on a diagram like this, you would know quite a lot that it was occurring naturally. And if you get there and you sort of, if you dig up the northwest area and, find, and eat it and find it's not salty, then you, you need to make some changes. Now, whilst you is involved with the compass. Wastu has a very great association with magnetic field. Anything that is, is cosmically orientated, of course, will be involved with the magnetic field. I mean, even the method, the, the strict Wastu method for finding north is quite a complicated procedure. In Wastu, you should not bring out your little compass. You should not bring out your iPhone with its Joey app low pan. <laughs> I, can, I confess I have one. <laughs> but in Wastu, you turn up at before dawn and you put a stake in the ground as the gnomon of a sundial. You then wait for sunrise and you mark out the passage and you go back at sunset and you mark where the sun has gone down and you do that for two or three days. Then you've, you can calculate from that where north is. I say, use the iPhone. <laughs> But associations, very general associations with the compass directions, the south would tend to bring problems. This is the, these, are, these are the facing orientations, your facing directions for a property. South facing will tend to bring problems because it's close to the southwest where all that confusion of prana exists. North is positive. West is neutral. If you've got a west-facing property, no problems. East-facing is positive because, again, Wastu is associated with the passage of the sun. I know it isn't the sun that moves. It's the earth, but that was debated in an earlier gathering and the Vatican have finally apologized, I believe. <laughs> if it faces southeast, it's good for women. <coughs> that means it's good for women, not good for men to find women. <laughs> there, is a, there is another association with feng shui and women. You know that um, in feng shui, if you step, stand in your front door and you can look southeast and you can see water, the master of the house will have many concubines. I do read some strange books. <laughs> Southwest, where the real tangle of toes and tails is, the final stagnation point of the prana that enters the space, is negative. Northwest is neutral. Northeast is best, because that's where the prana enters. So in the, if you're going to combine feng shui and wastu, once you get to the compass, 
you do have to make a decision which one are you going, are you going to use. I have been known to use bits of each because I believe a consultant should try to work to give the optimum result. And because it's then it's neither feng shui nor wasdu, I then call it spatial dynamics, which is a wheezy little title. Companies like that. Very simple best locations because I'm getting the finger or fingers about time. Within a home, those are the best locations. Again, your prayer room, an altar, anywhere you're going to practice meditation, any, any sort of spiritual discipline, northeast. Bathroom in the east. The advantage of Wastu, of course, is that north appears at the top of our diagrams. There's none of this sort of standing on your head all the time. Again, Wastu is a bit like feng shui because it's both disciplines are very keen to tell you where not to have your WC, but they very rarely tell you where you should have it. <laughs> but again, traditionally, that would have been outside the main house in both traditions. And so you have your, your master bedroom down in the southwest. It's the quietest, the least energy, and you get good sleep. The other two areas you can do what you like in, except that the center area, of course, is the most important part. It's the heart of the Wastu Purusha. Color. Wastu works with color. It works with the rainbow. Most of you, like me, were probably brought up that the colors of the rainbow were Roy G. Biv. If you were a Boy Scout, well, the ladies wouldn't have been Boy Scouts. But if you were a Boy Scout, you would have been told that the colors of the rainbow were Roy G. Biv. In Wastu, the energy moves the other way. You have the calm, safe, ultraviolet of the morning, and it moves through the day to the energetic, dangerous infrared of high noon. So if you're going to work with color, bear in mind the energy of the sun, the solar energy, as it changes during the day, and particularly what effect it has on you at those particular times. You see, it's all very natural, and all very cosmic. As feng shui has its money tree, and if all else fails, tell somebody to go out and buy a money tree and stick it in the wealth corner along with their lotto ticket. Basil is the money tree of Wastu, particularly the, the form of basil known as holy basil. And you'll find every reasonable Indian home has a pot of basil in it. Tulsi. And it's quite useful if you put it in the kitchen because you can then add it to things. Now there is a, I'm closing now, but there is a relationship also with Nine Star Key. Nine Star Key works on the nine stars and the expanded five elements. Within Wastu, there is a whole concept based on the nine regents of space. They, again, are related to stars. And down here in red, which you probably can't read, are the deities, their compass associations, and very brief single-word descriptions of their associations. So it is possible to actually relate nine-star key into a Wastu consultation. Can you read out the deities? Yes. In the center, we have Brahma. In the east, we have Indra. In the southeast, we have Agni. In the south, we have Yama. In the southwest, we have Nirti. In the west, we have Waruna. In the northwest, we have Wayu. In the north, we have Kubera. In the northeast, we have Soma. 
Soma is associated with, there is an association with Soma with magic mushrooms, which is probably more information than you need. <laughs> Kubera is the deity associated with wealth. And there are various, within Wastu, there are various mantra that can be recited to bring you wealth. In fact, there are mantra associated with each of those deities. There is also within Wastu a whole discipline based on yantra, which are the, are the symbols, if you like, going back to Christian's codes. These are symbols on which mantra will have been written, which can then be placed in various places, according to the compass, to enhance prosperity, fame, enlightenment, Agni is the deity of fire, Vayu is the deity of water. There is a whole discipline of placement, just as there is in Feng Shui. I think I'm about to run out of time. Let's see if we've got another one. No, we haven't. How about that? Thank you. Mm -hmm.